The scripture is from Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through 45. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me, to me. We're trying a little return to the pulpit. We'll see how it goes. And just one comment on the scripture. I think the goats get a bad rap. You know, they're always separating the goats and the sheep, but come on, goats are cute too. <laughs> they matter, they belong. One of the most stimulating periods of my sabbatical occurred during my time in North Carolina while attending the Penland School of Craft. I'd signed up for a class because I wanted to delve into the creative arts. And the description of the class looked interesting. The photography class would introduce students to 19th century photographic techniques. Like you've seen those old pictures like Abraham Lincoln and they're all looking serious. And the resulting pictures look kind of ethereal or dreamlike and I liked that. Now I'm a point and shoot type of gal. I can even take a decent digital picture. But this technique took us back to the early days of photography into a dark room with mysterious, dangerous chemicals, with the ultimate goal of creating a glass negative that then could be transformed into a, pho a photograph. On the first evening, the instructor, Dan uh, Estabrook, had us all introduce ourselves. One person was a rock and roll photographer. Two participants taught photography at major universities. One was known for her professional portrait photography, a well-known person. One was in charge of running the dark room at a huge university. Then there were two young, avid photography students. The instructor and assistant instructor had recently had their photography exhibited in a Paris art gallery. And then there was me. <laughs> I just thought the pictures looked cool. I could feel myself get smaller and smaller with each introduction. And I tried to not feel so intimidated, but I could feel my throat tighten. 
as my, as my time approached, and my eyes started to well up with tears. What was I doing here? I didn't belong. I was in a strange world, a stranger to the language, the equipment, the chemicals, the process. What was I thinking? I'd only wanted to engage in a creative process, and suddenly I felt like a complete stranger and outsider. I wanted to leave. I wanted to quit. But you know what? I knew the issue was me. Have you ever felt like an outsider? Like you don't belong? Like you don't fit in? Or maybe overwhelmed because you don't understand the language, the people, the customs, the perspectives that surround you? Maybe, as sometimes, you're just out of your league. To be a human being is to have the experience of not belonging. We can experience ourselves as strangers or treat others as though they are strangers for many reasons. We often size up people based on their financial status, social class, educational background, physical appearance, accent, skin color, political affiliation, gender identification, and we end up sizing our own selves up in comparison. Sometimes our sense of being outsider, though, is just something that happens within our own mind. The group might not see you as an outsider and might even want to welcome you, but because you don't have a certain skill set, knowledge, social status, familiarity with the group, you might identify yourself as the stranger. On the, other on the other hand, though, sometimes it's society that says, you don't belong. Certainly our LGBTQ plus community knows so well, and in some cases are harmed or killed. And our country has a painful, ugly history of enslavement, incarceration, oppression, rejection of groups of people deemed unfit for inclusion for a variety of reasons. At its core, however, the stranger experience seems to represent the unknown, something which is different, alien, foreign, outside of our circle of knowledge and comfort. And the stranger experience, whether social or internal, can lead to suspicion, hatred, exclusion, self-hate, insecurity, inferiority, sometimes even death. And yet there is another way. Our Judeo-Christian faith tradition has much to say about the stranger. One of the central tenets of our Judeo-Christian tradition, and you see it in many other traditions, Islam, a lot of other faith traditions, is the mandate to welcome the stranger. This is a central teaching. And the passage in Leviticus is, pa is powerful. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. The stranger who sojourns with you shall be to you as native among you. And you shall love him and her, I'm going to add that, as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. That's the whole passage.
Today, I want to explore how we might shift our attitudes and behaviors towards even ourselves and others as we learn to welcome the stranger. And to welcome a stranger is more than simply offering hospitality. To welcome the stranger means we start identifying with the other. Nurse educator Jean Watson writes, we learn from one another how to be human by identifying ourselves with others, finding our dilemma in their dilemma. What we all learn from this is self-knowledge. The self we learn about is every self. It is the universal human self. We learn to recognize ourselves in others. It keeps alive our common humanity and avoids reducing self or other to the moral status of object. Isn't that the truth? That's kind of what we do. Everybody becomes objects instead of brothers and sisters, children of God. It calls upon us to remember with compassion what it feels like to be a stranger in a strange land. It's about loving the other. It's telling us to treat the other as family because in the eyes of God, they are family. Now, I'm not talking about just opening your doors wide and saying, anybody, come on in. We all need boundaries. We need ways to assess. Um, this is not the same thing. This is an attitude and a behavior. And the scripture that Judy read, Jesus reminds us of the same thing. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. For I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters, you did it to me. And in this passage, Jesus identifies the very nature of his spirit, the nature of God being aligned with the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the imprisoned, the naked. And what you do to the least of these, you do to God. God is so embedded in our world and in our relationships. When we do it to the other, we're doing it to God. And yet, we put kids in cages, separate them from their parents, hospitals are bombed, individuals in the LGBTQ community are still at risk. My daughter and her wife um, and three children will be moving next year for their next job. They have to find a safe country. It's hard to find. So how do we move closer to be the people God calls us to be? I want to suggest that it is both an inner spiritual process and an outer process. In the context of our faith stance, we need people, congregations, communities of grace and acceptance. But there's a dual responsibility. The outsider is also called to advocate for him or herself. We also have to have some willingness to look inside our own hearts and minds. Looking at our own prejudices and inhumanity. You know, we can be strangers to ourselves. I can't tell you how many people I've heard who will just berate themselves 
They're inhuman to themselves. So it's always an ongoing internal process of internal process of transformation and an engagement with the world. A world that is out of order, that is estranged from its own humanity. Jesus was an interesting teacher. He didn't just pat victimized individuals on the back and say, poor you, you've been mistreated. He never stopped there. He had intense compassion. But he would say, pick up your pallet and walk. Go and sin no more. He gave them a new image for themselves. And then sometimes it was the individual who had to advocate for herself or himself. There's a woman who reaches out and touches the garment of Jesus as he's walking by. And then there's the widow who says, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He also, of course, calls out the ways of society, the hypocrites. Woe to you teachers of the law, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. And then he says, take out the log of your own eye before you notice your neighbor. So again, there's always this inner look and this outer ramification. You know, in my class that night, I had four days ahead of me. I had some options. I could quit and adapt, adopt the mantle of stranger and incapable. Just can't do it. I could push through it and just tough it out. You know, this, is, this class has been paid for. It's the Lily Grant. What would the church think? I could just tough it out and see myself as a wannabe. Or I could examine the fear and insecurity. I could become vulnerable honest. In my case, I shared my anxiety with the instructor. He reassured me it was okay to be a beginner and that others might actually learn something because they've all developed habits of their own. So I was kind of fresh. I was a baby. I started calling myself the baby photographer. And over the next couple of days, he would make sure I understood. He would explain a process twice, if necessary. He would call me up to stand right by him in the dark room so I could get a good look. And it wasn't just, here's the, here's the you know, the beginner. It was really inviting me in. And this little bit of encouragement was transforming. And it took the experience from being an outsider to being a participant. From that of being incompetent to one who may have some promise. It took an instructor who had grace and sensitivity. That means an environment, like our community. We need to have an environment that offers grace and sensitivity. But it also took a willingness to advocate to not give up, to say, I'm here. Now this was not just a moment of great, this was not some moment of great social significance. But it does illustrate how easy it is to feel outside. And think of the outcome for our LGBTQ plus community, enslaved people, women throughout history who said, if they hadn't advocated and said, I am a full human being. I deserve life and liberty, freedom to love. What would happen? So there's always this, this dual aspect. But underneath it is an image that we get from God. In the beginning, we were created 
in the image of God. There's an image underneath it all that says, we are full human beings loved by God in all our difference. It takes tremendous courage to say, I belong. But our faith reminds us that it is true. You belong. By extending a welcome to strangers, each other, and even ourselves, we are defying the way things are in the world and the way the world expects us to be and even wants us to be, needs us to be. But by extending a welcome to the strangers, we are also stepping into our own true humanity. God's love, God's grace, God's inclusive spirit is all around us. But it also behooves us to look, see, receive, respond, open, care. And when we can do that, lives are not only changed, but saved. And certainly Fatima and Azadula, the incredible journey that they took to survive, to, to come to a place where they can lead lives of safety. I just want to honor all of you and them, their, their courage to journey and your courage to take them in and help them become their own free people. And um, I've got a beautiful letter here from Fatima. Azadula is going to write one too. We're going to save this for next week. Uh, so we won't read it today, but it's just a, a letter of beauty from Fatima. And Azadula is going to write something too. It's, it's amazing. But again, this is what it looks like to welcome to have strangers no more in our midst, to move beyond thinking as them and moving to an us as a family of God. Thank you all. <laughs>